Welcome to another video teaching from Freedom Amarillo. We're delighted that you're with us and taking the time to study with us. God has great things in store for us as we dig into His Word. And let me remind you, we're about loving God and loving people. So thank you for being a part of our study today. I'm excited to uh, begin to talk again about festivals. We're going to spend a few minutes talking about the festivals of the Lord. It's time for the fall festivals. And we as a congregation are excited about what God's doing in our midst and the opportunity to be able to celebrate together and uh, to commemorate these festivals that God has set before us. Now, we've learned, uh, as you'll see on this uh, slide on the screen, festivals teach us how to, to celebrate our relationship with God. Now, we're learning more about God and His character and he's given us a lot of tools to be able to uh, help us understand what he's doing in the world from the beginning to the end. So we've learned that festivals help us just to celebrate who God is and our relationship with him. So as we study the festivals, I want you to keep that in mind as you think about them and, and discern what it means for you and your relationship with the Lord. We've learned that festivals teach us a lot about history. As we go back and study the festivals, especially the spring festivals, we see that it gives us a lot of, of insight into God's preparation for the coming of the Messiah. And for many, many years, thousands of years, Jews and others celebrated these festivals, not really understanding what they meant. But then they were fulfilled, or at least we would say partially fulfilled. I think that there's a great possibility that God will use these specific dates again that will be very significant. Maybe in the millennial reign, I'm not sure. But I think it's interesting for us to see. I don't think it's over and done because God says for us to celebrate these. Part of it is remembering what has happened. So as we have celebrated the spring festivals, we understand what God has already done. We, we've seen the fulfillment of that. Then we look forward to what God is doing in the future as prophecy. And then we realize that, well, for today it has meaning. So it's past, present, and future uh, experiences of walking with God through the festivals that give us insight into who God is. Now, I think there's a, a, a very good insight into the festivals that slipped in right there in the very beginning of Genesis. And I'd like to start there with you today. Genesis chapter 1, verse 14. It says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Now, let me catch, up, catch you up with us. Uh, we've studied about uh, the days of creation. Let me just remind you of where we are. When we get to verse 14, we've already passed three days. Remember on the first day, beginning in uh, verse 2 through verse 5, God created light. Now, he separated the light from darkness, and he called the light day and the darkness night. That was the first day. Day two, God created an expanse to separate the water above from the water below. That was day two verses 6 through 8. Day 3 comes along, verses 9 through 13. God gathered the water into one place, and dry land appeared, earth and sea. He made vegetation grow, and it was the third day, and it was great. Now, the sun doesn't come along until this fourth day in verse 14. So we have to realize that the 24-hour pattern of time was not created until the fourth day. So we don't have any way of, of measuring or marking time on day one, two, and three. We don't know how long they were. It's, not, it's immaterial to us about how long they were. But this gives an open door for uh, scientists to put the dates and how long it is, and it still fits perfectly with the creation story in God's Word uh, that day one, light was created. How long it took for before day two, we don't know. That's God's timing. But then after day four, he sets up this system of 24-hour rotational 
uh, days, um, day and night. He teaches us through this uh, lesson here that the day begins in the evening at sunset and goes to the evening of the next, uh, uh, next evening, which makes up the day. So in our Gregorian uh, Julian calendar and, and the, the thought pattern that we have of, of uh, a Greco-Roman, maybe uh, similar thought pattern, uh, of looking at times, we see a day starting at midnight. Well, with God and his calendar, it starts at sunset in the evening. So we'll have to look at that as we look at the, uh, the festivals and see how we celebrate them, when we celebrate them. So on the fourth day, uh, this is verse 14 that we have on, on the board here. It says, look. Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Now, this is the King James. Many of you have read that for, for years. And, and most of our translations follow right along with the, with the ideas that King James laid out there. Uh, a few years ago, Someone shared with me about the wording, the original Hebrew words here, and the different meanings that they take on. And, uh, and I, I looked at that, and we're going to break these down very quickly and just show you. This is about the first part of here is uh, to divide the day from the night. Now, we know that the sun and the moon do that. And, uh, and that's the first step that he said. And the second thing is to let them be for signs. Now, what kind of signs? We have to think and, and try to figure out. Well, uh, the constellations are signs, and they paint a picture. They're like a billboard that teach us. And, and all through the Scripture, we find him talking about the constellations and, and how we can actually uh, study those and understand the, the movement that God has put there. Then he says the next thing is for seasons. Well, I'd always thought... Spring, uh, you know, and summer and, and fall and winter and those seasons. And that, that is a possibility and that is a, a correct translation. We're going we're gonna to look at that one in just a minute and see how it works. Then it says it's for days and for years. So definitely the 24-hour period and the 365 days. And we see how it, it works together for for days and for years. But let's go back and look at that for signs, for seasons. Now, here it is in the Holman translation. I like this translation. It helps me. It says, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to what? Separate the day from the night. Now, that's the same way that uh, King James rendered this. Then it says, and they will serve for signs for festivals. Very interesting. Now, we had signs and seasons a moment ago in King James and NIV and a bunch of others. But here he says to serve as signs for festivals. And then he goes for days and for years. So we have this discrepancy of, of signs and seasons or signs for seasons. And we want to go back and, and look at that and see what we can come up with and see why it's that. Well, the key to that is this Hebrew word right here. It is translated as moed. Now, in, in that translation, it's, uh, it's moedim, but we, we look here at moed, the root word of that. It's the Strong's number 4150. And we, we find when you look that up that it can be translated as season. It can be translated as feast. It can be a, translated as appointed or as a, assembly or, or solemn or even a day. It's very interesting how that works. It's translated many times as congregation. So this moed is a multifaceted word. And I'm not saying that any of the translators have mistranslated it. I think that God put that in there for us to see that there are some indications from the very beginning about his appointed times. Now, moed can be translated appointed. It can be translated as times. It can be translated as appointed times. So 
uh, or it can be translated as festivals, which are the appointed times. So there in Genesis, the first chapter, I think we have the first uh, mention of, or at least indication of, God's plan for his appointed times, his festivals. I believe appointed times are very important for us. I think that not only the festivals of the Lord, the seven festivals, and then, of course, the Sabbath day is an appointed time. God has many other appointed times that are on his calendar. I believe that even for myself, God has appointed my time, a time that I will meet the Lord, a time that I will die. So I have an appointed time, a time that I don't have any control of, but God has already set the appointed time. So as we look at this Moed and the Moedim, we'll dig a little bit deeper and see kind of what it has to say for us and how it thrusts us into festivals of the Lord. So we go to one of our favorite chapters, Leviticus 23, and I'll show you that word. This is verse 2 in the Hebrew, and if you're like me, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm learning just enough to be maybe dangerous in, in Hebrew, but I can identify this word that we've circled there as the moed, but it's moedim. It's the plural form of that same word, moedim. So in Leviticus 23, 2, we, we find that same word that was in Genesis 1, 14. And let's look at it in English so it'll help us a little bit better. The scripture says, speak to the Israelites and tell them, these are my appointed times, the times of the Lord that you will proclaim as sacred assemblies. Now, that moedim is translated here as appointed times. These are my festivals. These are my appointed times. Uh, it can even branch over into that congregation uh, because the congregation together is going to celebrate. It's going to be a holy convocation, you'll find out. That means a gathering of God's people as they come together to do that. And then for emphasis, he put my, and the translation here has the my uh, circled uh, in uh, capital letters indicating that it is God himself, the yud heh vav uh, speaking. These are my appointed times. So God appointed them. He calls them his Jewish festivals or other kinds of festivals. But these are his festivals. He gives us an invitation to come and we are welcome to come and celebrate at his appointed time. Now, as we look further in the scripture there, the next verse in Leviticus 23, verse 3 says, work may be done for six days. And actually, if you look at some other translations, it may is not uh, if you want to, but you should be working for the other six days. But on the seventh day, there must be a Sabbath of complete rest, a sacred assembly. Now, we in our generation and our, our culture have just forgotten about Sabbath. Uh, it's, uh, we've studied with you before, and you've, you can look at those videos about the, the seventh-day Sabbath, the Saturday that we understand is the Sabbath of God's teaching. We've uh, done away with that as a society many years ago, and now even the Sunday is not considered as a day of rest. It's different than the other days, but it's not a complete day of rest. And that's what God says that it should be. And he's given us instruction right here in Leviticus 23. We have many other places that teach about the Sabbath, but this is the first in his list of appointed feasts. He says, you are not to do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord wherever you live. And then he goes on in verse four and says, these are the Lord's appointed times the sacred assemblies you are to proclaim at their appointed times. The Moedim, sacred assemblies, appointed times. These are God's appointed times. Now that, again, is that word Moed. Now in the King James Version, it's translated as feast 23 times, season only 13, appointed 12, and time 12, but as congregation 150 times. So it, 
it's wrapped around all of these things. It's the feast, the festival of the Lord on an appointed time by the congregation, this Moed. I'd like to understand a little bit more about the Moedim, the Moed of God. This is God's timetable that we're trying to understand. It's a 24-hour thing, but it's a, a cycle given to us by the moon, and God set it uh, forth from the very beginning, from day four of creation, and I think indicated to us that there are the festivals are coming. So as we look at that, uh, very quickly, let's talk about this, the festivals. There's prophecy in all seven of the feasts, and we could spend quite a lot of time just uh, looking at what has already happened and what is prophesied through the scripture about what is going to happen on these particular days. Uh, you can do a little study and find out that throughout history, the festival dates have been very important to God's people. And there are many very important things that have happened on festival dates, appointed times. So the spring feast, we've already celebrated this year. They uh, are Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. And we look at those and we realize that uh, each of them has such significance in our understanding, particularly of the Messiah and what he's done and how he's come and died for us. Passover is representative of the killing of the lamb. And you remember, you go back into the Exodus story, and they were told to, to uh, sacrifice a lamb, take the blood of the lamb, paint it on their doorposts, and they were to eat a meal in, in haste, and they were to leave bondage and go to a promised land. Well, that's, that's the picture of salvation for us today as we understand what that means. Passover represents the passing over of the death angel during this 10th plague that we have in Egypt. Now, I think, personal opinion, that it was actually the Passover of God, that he hovered over his people like a hen covers her chicks to protect them, and that the death angel was not permitted to get close to God's people, and hence a Passover there. Uh, just another way of looking at it. But we realize that this Passover has been fulfilled in the coming and dying of our Passover lamb. The scripture teaches us that Jesus, Yeshua, became our Passover lamb. And by accepting his sacrifice or putting the blood on the door of our heart, we leave bondage and we start toward the promised land on a journey with the Lord. Many times it seems like we're in the wilderness, but God is leading us to that promised land, Passover. Unleavened bread uh, comes next, and we see that it represents the taking away of sin. Now, in the festival of unleavened bread, you are to clean the yeast out of your house. And we see in Scripture that yeast represents sin. So as we look at unleavened bread, we realize that God is teaching us that we are to clean the sin out of our lives. We are to separate ourselves from that. And God is to become the, the most important part as the cleansing of sin from our life of unleavened bread. And then we have first fruits, and we realize that, that uh, God became, Jesus became, Yeshua became the first fruits as he was represented, represented as the unleavened bread, the one without sin, that sin uh, had no part of, and he was and fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread in his life. And he fulfilled first fruits by resurrecting on the Feast of First Fruits and going before the Father as a wave offering, presenting himself as the first fruits with many to come. And then, of course, Pentecost. Pentecost, 50 days later, after Yeshua was resurrected and walked with his apostles for 40 days, appeared among many people, then he told them to go back to Jerusalem and wait. And 10 days later, or 50 days, as Pentecost means, 
they were given the Holy Spirit, and things began to change. Lives were turned around. The church began to, uh, to flourish, and the, the power of God's Holy Spirit was up, uh, upon them. And how interesting we see the fulfillment of these spring festivals, Passover, Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Pentecost. Now, it's the time of year for fall feasts. So let's look at those and see what they represent and what they are trying to teach us about God's timing. Trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. We've had the first four and now we have the fulfillment of the last three. We're looking forward to seeing what God is going to do on these appointed times, on these special days that he set aside. So the first one to come in just a few days is the Feast of Trumpets. Now, let's go back to Leviticus 23, and we'll skip down to verse 23, and we'll see what, what God has to say in his word about the Feast of Trumpets. The Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, or when there's a new moon, the seventh new moon, that's the time, you are to have a day of complete rest, commemoration, and joyful shouting, a sacred assembly. Now, um, King James translates that a little bit differently. Uh, that was the Holman translation, what you see on the screen. Now let's put King James there and see what he says. It says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, exactly what we've said before, shall ye have a Sabbath of memorial of blowing of trumpets. So as you look and dig down into those words and see the translations, King James was still adhering to and understood about the festivals and put in there that this is the memorial. This is a Sabbath day's rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and it is a holy convocation. So we look at that first moon, new moon of the seventh month, and we realize that this year the Feast of Trumpets, or Yom Teruah, is going to be on October 2-3. Now, uh, in our, as, as I explained earlier, and as you already know, uh, it doesn't fall on one particular day from midnight to midnight, but from sunset on one day to sunset the following day, we would say following day, but in God's interpretation, that day. It begins with a sunset and ends with a sunset. So Sunday, October the 2nd, at evening, uh, at sunset begins the festival until Monday evening, that 24-hour period, is when the festival of trumpets will occur this year. I'm excited about what's going to happen and what God's going to do in our midst. And as our congregation gathers to, to, to worship together and to praise the Lord, we're, we're uh, having anticipation of what is going to develop and what God is going to do at this year at the Feast of Trumpets. Now let me show you some scriptures, not nearly all of them, but uh, because we don't have time, but a few scriptures that allude to and give us some indication about what the Feast of Trumpets is all about and how that's going to uh, impact our world in the future. Maybe this year, maybe next year, maybe some other year. We don't know exactly the year, but we, I believe we do know the date. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Listen, this is Paul teaching, and he's sharing with the, the church at Corinth. And he, he says, I'm telling you a mystery. So listen carefully, and let's figure out what this mystery is. He says, we will all fall asleep. Now, that was the terminology for passing away or dying. We will all die, but... We will all be changed in the moment, in, a, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. Praise the Lord, right? Well, that's an exciting verse. Well, there's some hidden things in there that, uh, that we need to dig out and see what he's talking about. This is going to happen 
in a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet. Well, so that means there's trumpets before it. Maybe that's the last of the festival of trumpets. Oh, but I don't think so because there are uh, things that we're going to be celebrating even in the time of the millennial reign we see in the scripture. But what could it be then? Well, if you look in uh, the book of Revelation, you see a series of trumpet blasts, and maybe that's talking about the last one. The trumpet's going to sound. The dead in Christ will rise. It's at the sound of the last trumpet. Here's a, a, a little quick look at those seven trumpets, uh, seven interesting number, is it not, of the trumpets that happen in uh, Revelation. And we find that that seventh trumpet uh, we find in Revelation 11 is is the ushering in of the kingdom of God. So I believe that that's when the Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus, returns and ushers in his millennial reign, the kingdom of God. Many would say that's the rapture. That's when all of this comes to an end for us. But I would say it comes to a changing point for us. And, and whether... It's before, or mid, or after the tribulation. Uh, it's a time that we're looking forward to when the last trumpet will blow and God ushers in his millennial reign. Yeshua sets up his kingdom and rules and reigns from Jerusalem. What an exciting day for Feast of Trumpets. Well, the book of Joel has some things to say about it. It says, blow the horn in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the residents of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. In fact, it is near. So what are we talking about about the day of the Lord? We're talking about the return of our Messiah, Yeshua. He's coming uh, to redeem his bride. He's coming to set up his kingdom and rule and reign. Joel, the prophet, is prophesying about it. We also see it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, this feast of trumpets, the Yom Teruah that we're looking at. He says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Isn't that amazing of what may happen, I would say will happen on the feast of trumpets. Let me encourage you to study a little bit deeper about the festivals of the Lord. And as we celebrate each of these festivals, we'll be teaching a little bit more about them and more in depth about what they represent, the prophecy, the past history, and actually the present time of understanding more about God, how he works in our lives, how he set up his appointed times from that very first day of creation or fourth day of creation, the very first chapter in his word, teaching us about his appointed times. Do we have appointed times that we need to meet with the Lord? Yes. I encourage you to spend some time in meditation. Searching in God's Word. What is it, God, that you want from me? What is it that you want me to do? How do you want me to learn more about your character and implement that into my life? These are the things that I believe God teaches us through the festivals of the Lord. Thank you for being a part of this teaching ministry. Uh, we look forward to you joining us again. Shalom.